Professor Schimmel back with part four of Functional Anatomy of Prokaryotic Cells. All right, you guys, let's wrap this bad boy up. As promised, I'm going to pick up the discussion with gas vacuoles. All right, some bacteria have pockets, cavities of gas in their cytoplasm, it, likely carbon dioxide gas. And the bacteria that have gas vacuoles, here are some things that are usually true. Typically they are um, living in an aquatic environment in the water. And typically they are capable of using a process known as photosynthesis. And that means um, harnessing light energy to um, uh, produce glucose from carbon dioxide and, um, and water. Um, now, a couple of examples of bacteria that can do this um, is um, the genus Halobacterium, and those are um, very primitive bacteria, members of that domain Archaea that we talked about earlier um, in the course, and um, also the cyanobacteria, sometimes called the blue-green algae, but they are prokaryotic. Uh, these are a couple of examples of bacteria that have gas vacuoles. Okay, let's think this through. Um, you live in an aquatic environment, you require sunlight to um, uh, fuel your um, um, metabolism, and why would a gas vacuole be an advantageous thing to have? Well, gas vacuoles make the cells buoyant, meaning they, they float on the surface of the water where they're gonna receive maximum quantities of sunlight. Okay, gas vacuoles. And last but certainly not least are endospores. All right, you have a diagram. Oh, I know you're not gonna be able to see um, all the detail like this, but I am operating under the assumption that you've got this document in front of you, so I'm just gonna to have to move on. Okay, let's talk about endospores. Okay, now remember the exceptions thing. I told you for pretty much everything. I tell you there's an exception to it. There are a couple here and it makes me feel squirrely thinking about like not telling you, but I'm not gonna, you can ask me in class if you care, which you probably don't, but, and that's okay too. Okay, I'm babbling. Let's talk about the formation of endospores. Some bacteria produce endospores. What the heck are they? Well, endospores are a dormant, meaning inactive, dormant stage in the life cycle of that bacterium. Uh, endospores have very thick protein coatings called the endospore coat. Uh, this um, protein coating um, allows the endospore to survive in very adverse conditions. Uh, for example, in dry soil, no nutrients available for exceptionally long periods of time. Could be months, years, decades, centuries, or longer, okay? Um, so, thick protein coating, endospore coat, um, dormant stage in the life cycle of the bacterium. We'll look at the, the life cycle, excuse me, uh, the process of endospore formation in just a second. Uh, the process of forming endospores is sometimes referred to as sporulation or sporogenesis. Now, here's where there's an exception, but I'm going to make this statement, and this is what we'll, um, um, we'll use for purposes of uh, the exams that you guys will be taking. There are six genera, that means uh, genera is plural of the, um, the plural form of the word genus. Six genera of gram-positive bacteria that produce endospores, right? So I'm not gonna get into a big deep discussion of this, but let's just say for our purposes, there are no gram-negative endospore forming bacteria. We'll live through this. Okay, uh, two examples of genera that produce endospores. One is a genus called Bacillus. The other is a genus called Clostridium. Now, the reason that we're so interested in these bacteria is because there are some very important pathogens in these groups. For example, I'm betting you've heard of Bacillus anthracis. That's the cause of the disease known as anthrax. In the genus um, Clostridium, three come to mind. Uh, Clostridium perfringens causes a disease known as gas gangrene. Clostridium botulinum causes a, um, a food intoxication called botulism, and um, Clostridium tetani causes the disease known as tetanus, and we're going to talk about those diseases later this semester. 
Now, these bacteria are typically found in the soil, sometimes in, in water, like in the sediment of fresh water, for example, but let's just say soil. And um, let's talk about, um, there is some vocabulary that I've kind of handwritten in here. Um, again, before we go um, looking at the process of endospore formation, let's, let's look at these terms. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, the term vegetative cell. That refers to the active stage in the bacterium's life cycle. I think it sounds backwards. I think vegetative, I think inactive couch potato, but I'm telling you, that's what it means, vegetative cell in the um, context of microbiology. Endospore, that's the dormant, highly resistant um, stage of these bacteria, resistant to um, high temperature, resistant to exposure to certain chemicals, um, uh, able to survive, as I said earlier, without water or nutrients for extended periods of time. All right, next, uh, there are stained endospores or stained using the Schaefer-Fulton method. Malachite green is the primary stain. We've been there before. And how, to, how do endospores return to the vegetative or active state? Uh, well, if the endospore coat is damaged, for example, there are other scenarios, but if the endospore coat is damaged, um, let's say by um, pressure or mechanical nicking, uh, by a mineral, and there is um, water and um, there are nutrients present in the environment, the um, water will be literally drawn into the cell, kind of like taking a dry sponge and throwing it in the sink with some water, um, and um, the cell will rehydrate and uh, it may take a day or two, but it will um, actually reanimate um, if the conditions are correct. Uh, if the conditions are not favorable, if that damage to the endospore coat occurs, the, end, the endospore, the cell will perish. Okay, now let's look at how endospores are formed. Uh, as it says on your diagram, prior to the first little drawing, uh, the bacterial chromosome has replicated itself. And uh, so we've got a bacterial cell with um, two chromosomes for just a moment here, one located at each pole of the cell. All right, in, um, in diagram A, I don't even know why I'm holding this up. I know you can't see it like this, so hopefully you've got it in front of you. But in um, drawing A, what we're seeing is the bacterial cell, two chromosomes. I don't know why they drew one smaller than the other. Uh, it, they should be the same size. But anyways, it looks like little fingers kind of coming in like this. That would be the plasma membrane beginning to invaginate and surround one of those chromosomes to separate it from the rest of the cell. By the time I get to step B, you can see that process um, has uh, been completed. And now we have what's called a septum surrounding one of the chromosomes, a little bit of cytoplasm, maybe a few um, ribosomes and some enzymes, um, bare bones in that um, endospore that we're going to form. All right, step C, I, I know this is difficult to see even on your diagram, but anyways, what's happened here is that a second layer of plasma membrane forms around the first one. So we've got all that stuff in the uh, center of the, our endospore and two layers of uh, cell membrane. Uh, now we refer to the um, developing endospore as a four spore, right? That's an immature endospore. Step D, we're going to add a layer of peptidoglycan between those two layers of plasma membrane. And in step E, we're going to add a really thick protein coating called the endospore coat. Once the endospore is um, uh, completely processed, the vegetative cell is going to lyse and release the endospore into the environment. And um, I can't think of any exceptions to this, but uh, when I think of endospore formation, I think of each vegetative cell producing one endospore. All right, um, a little bit about your responsibilities uh, for this um, particular topic. 150 students, you're gonna be expected to, as a uh, potential essay question, to not only answer questions about what I just discussed, but also to um, recreate this diagram and explain what's going on at each step. Um, 102 students, intro micro students, um, you, you won't be doing an essay on this, but you will be asked some rather detailed questions about this uh, information, including uh, the examples of the two genera, Bacillus and Clostridium. Okay, folks, we both thought this would never happen, but I'm done with this chapter. Talk to you soon.